This is God and Autobiography, the podcast. Episode 119. Jerry has a conversation with Dr. Christopher Denny, Associate Professor of Theology and Religious Studies at St. John's University. I well remember how I first met Christopher. He'd written a brilliant paper on two important theologians of, of our period, Francis Clooney and Ramon Panikkar. He was at a conference. In fact, he was chair of the conference uh, that I was attending of uh, religious studies scholars and theologians. I approached him and introduced myself and said, read your article. I would love to talk about it. And from that time on, we have been friends. He's written a kind of tour de force on one of the greatest theologians of the 20th century, Hans Urs von Balthasar. It was a challenging project because Balthasar worked a lot with literature. Christopher had to master this enormous corpus of literature and in the original languages. When we first started the Theology Without Walls project, Christopher came to the very first meeting. He's been rapporteur for that group's annual uh, planning meeting, has made very important scholarly contributions to it and to our discussion. So as you listen to this episode, Chris, what struck you about it? I think what sticks foremost in my mind is the fact that when we talk about wisdom and about religion, we're always cognizant that religion is fundamentally a response, is something that from the Roman etymology of the word in Latin, it binds us to uh, an encounter with someone, something, some reality larger than ourselves. When you read a lot of contemporary religious studies or contemporary theology, that mode of dialogue has been pushed aside. And yet, if we go back to the foundations of the Greek philosophical tradition, there's a reason why Plato wrote in the dialogue format and why Anselm uses the dialogue format, uh, why a contemporary writer, for example, like Elizabeth Johnson, uses the dialogue format. And so it was just, I think, really uh, refreshing to read a dialogue and not just uh, a monologue. Scott Langdon, when he read God in Autobiography, it struck him as dramatic because of that dialogic feature. It's a person talking to God and God talking back. Religion is a response. Presumably the religion is speaking to some questions they already had. It's not engendering the questions, but it's responding. One of the things that a lot of philosophies of religion do in the modern period is they like to formulate the religious quest in explicitly existential terms. Uh, who am I? Why am I here? But that doesn't exhaust the range of questions. I think Tillich was on to something when he defined religion as ultimate concern. Concerns aren't always verbalized as questions. And concerns somehow deal with more tangible. Going back to the ancient world, people look to religion for how can I ensure a good harvest? As long as we're cognizant of the fact that questions aren't always those of the armchair scholars, I think the idea of religion as a question or or addressing a felt human need is certainly a, a particularly compelling way to think about what religion is. There are several needs that surface in this episode. Concerns, maybe use that ultimate concern type of language. One is suffering. And so the question is, you know, what do we learn about suffering? He quote, I think, suffering is the law of growth in the universe. Well, that's a rather different perspective on suffering. Did that make any sense to you? Do you see any life wisdom in that kind of thought? Sure. I mean, when we go back to the Greek tragedy, and I believe it's in uh, one of Aeschylus' plays, the chorus says, with suffering comes wisdom. And in the Christian tradition, we have people like Anselm talking about the redemption of Jesus in terms of a debt satisfaction theory. And I'm also influenced by the Canadian Jesuit Bernard Lonergan, who described the sort of anthropological 
act of transcendence as conforming to what Lonergan called the law of the cross, his way of sort of updating more traditional Christian theological language of satisfaction into a more existential key. Suffering is one of those things where the meaning depends on the context. So we can identify suffering as being masochistic or as neurotic if we only look at suffering in an individualistic guise. So if I were to sort of harm myself in some way, God forbid, I would be seen as psychologically in need of treatment. But if I were to train to run a marathon, for example, which certainly involves a lot of suffering, or if I was to volunteer on a night shift to go feed uh, the homeless, that would certainly involve a disruption of my schedule and also suffering. And I think when people see the communal context of suffering, they see suffering in a completely different light. If God is someone who is a being for others, then to say that suffering is inherent in existence is a very, very different characterization than you might find, say, in a lot of popular psychology these days, where the goal is to overcome suffering. I'm not sure that's possible. The advice here, and it seemed to fit the Aeschylus quote you mentioned at the beginning, is to find the wisdom in suffering, is to learn something from your suffering. And in another chapter, I look at a period with which I suffered. Now, what did I learn from that? The things we have to go through in life, even the negative things, have something to teach us. God seems like a completely self-sufficient being. Why does he care about us? Why does he care about whether we pay any attention to God? He's set. <laughs> this is how my naive understanding of this uh, impermeable, unchanging, uh, divine being not affected by anything. Then why is he affected by our disobedience, whether that we're not paying attention? One of the things I do with my undergraduate students is to tell them about the Council of Nicaea and what I call the crisis of classical theism. As Christianity becomes enculturated into the Greco-Roman world in its earliest centuries, you have a collision between this, what we'd call from a philosophical perspective these days, a classically theistic formulation of God in which God is omniscient, omnipotent, omnibenevolent, and then a sort of Judeo-Christian biblical notion of God in which the surface language of the Jewish and Christian scriptures reveals a God to be anything but the, the classically theist God the philosophers are comfortable with. Christian theologians in the Middle Ages tried to resolve this conundrum by redefining what it meant to be God. If God is conceived of as independent, fundamentally walled off, if you will, on some sort of uh, Olympus from the human race, the Christian story really doesn't make any sense. And I think historically, when that conception of God has become dominant, you start to see Christianity wane. Uh, this was the argument in a book by Michael Buckley a couple decades ago, in which he sort of blamed modern atheism uh, on the rise of deism in the Enlightenment. What Christians have tried to do is to say that God, by God's very nature, is diffusive of goodness, is diffusive of love. God is fundamentally in relationship. From a Christian perspective, this is seen in the Trinity. God is not a person, but a community of three persons. That notion of relationality being intrinsic to the question of, of God's very existence is, I think, one way I, at least as a Christian, try to deal with your question, why should God care? And the answer I come up with, which leads to other questions, is because that's who God is. Right. Relationality is essential to God's being. This particular episode seems to take one step beyond that, which is, you are my face onto the world. It's hard on people for me to love them. <laughs> I need you to do it for me, God says here. And in fact, you are my eyes and ears. My wife, Abigail, sometimes says God can't mail a letter. So if you want something done in the world, you mainly have to think, oh, this is our job. Giving food to the poor at night, <laughs> that's our job. You can't just pray for manna from heaven. We have to go do something to help our fellow man. 
you know, I wondered, you know, if Jesus is God, how can God just be angry? That seems kind of like a low level emotion, not a sublime emotion. Well, he's an example of how a finite human creature, a human being, because he's in fully human form, uh, even if he's incarnation, and subject to all these feelings and desires and, and emotions that we all are, how a being with those kinds of limitations can nevertheless give boundless love. We're all very limited beings, but we, we can all give some love. And in fact, we can probably give more than we think we can. We don't have to just feather our own nest, even though, you know, we have to pay attention to our nest, you might say, take care of the business of our own lives. But in addition to that, we can do a lot of self-giving to others. A lot of times when people in telling the Christian story want to talk about God's image, they skip ahead to a very rarefied conception of what it means to be a human being, one that owes a lot more to Greek philosophy than it does to the Bible. I'll ask students, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? The students generally will begin with responses such as, we're rational or we have free will. But the original word in Genesis chapter 1 for image is zelem. And in ancient times, uh, biblical Hebrews uh, word zelem referred actually to a carved statue, if you will, of a Near Eastern king that would be paraded around the royal domains as an extension of the monarch's authority itself. For a contemporary analogy, when you go into a federal office building these days in the United States, you will see in the lobby an officially authorized photograph of the president of the United States, which is in many ways the zelem of our contemporary commander-in-chief. So when we think about that image of God, what that means for humanity, then I think it becomes much more earthy and tangible. Because to talk about exercising God's domain in the world or having a share in God's domain makes it more comprehensible why being in relationship with our fellow images of God is God-like. And it places obligations on us. One reviewer reviewing got an autobiography for a parenting magazine, of all things, took from it passages like this. The message, we are God's ambassadors. You know, if you're carrying the image of God, that would be a kind of one thing an ambassador might well do. And his behavior reflects on the king whom he represents. And the person thought, what a wonderful message for our children, that we bear that royal imprint and we have to kind of live up to that it's a, a blessing of course because it shows kind of our potential and role but it's also a uh, burden in the sense of not scot-free you, you have responsibilities and you can live up to them or you can fail them and we see shortly afterwards in the genesis story that the man and the woman fail to live up to their zelem calling it's always a challenge and one in which we have to be attentive and self-critical? Have we sort of foregrounded our response to the ultimate, or have we sort of taken a shortcut to make the ultimate synonymous with our own egos? Sure, that's uh, very easy to do. I sometimes think in terms of the idolatry of belief, because it's not just ego, or maybe ego is behind this, but it's where instead of kind of worshiping God, people are worshiping their own belief system, their own creed or their own denomination or their own liturgy in medieval Britain, they almost came to blows over which day the Sabbath was. There was a minor civil war over, was it Saturday or Sunday? People can be very attached to their belief systems, and that can be a block not only in their ability to reflect the divine and to be an appropriate image of the divine, but their ability to fulfill the function of loving other people. Again, in this episode, God needs us to do that for him. I was told in another chapter, when I'm asking God to love me in some context, I think, in which I feel at risk, he says, let Abigail love you. <laughs> I will love you through her. That is concrete, that kind of thought. Yes, and, and I think the danger of speech about God, which another name for that is theology, is that we start paying more attention to the speech and less to... God, the ultimate, what have you, and that 
what originally was a responsive mode of existence becomes a sort of self-centered mode of existence in which you sort of become enamored of your own thought. I think in some ways the Abrahamic traditions are particularly susceptible to this problem in as much as they have what we call a canon. God spoke certain times and then God may speak at other times but not in the same way or with merely derivative authority. I think the real challenge is for traditions such as these to foreground their own traditions and experiences that have been mediated through the community, while at the same time remaining responsive to the concrete others with whom they live, with whom we all live. I believe it's the United Church of Christ that several years ago came up with the slogan, God is still speaking. Even though that sort of pitched a tent in sort of moral and, and intra-Christian debates of over changing morals around sexual activity and so on, in and of itself, it really, I thought, was unassailable. I don't know of a single Christian who could deny categorically that God is not still speaking. I can't speak as a Jew or as a Muslim, I, but I would be very confident in saying that would probably be an assertion that the other two Abrahamic religions would hold as well. Allah is still speaking. The God of Israel and I is still speaking. Um, where? Well, that's the challenge to go find where that speech is happening. I think that's a very important insight, and I'm glad they were saying that. Of course, it's crucial to me because here's God speaking to me, and every reader or listener has to decide, was this sound like God to them? That's the challenge of spiritual discernment. I immediately, having this experience, ran off. Being an epistemologist, for one thing, is this the real deal? So I called a friend who I thought was knowledgeable about such things, since I was not interested in religion, had not followed all of this, and he said, oh, yeah, that's the problem of spiritual discernment, where we opened this particular episode, which was, was the surreal deal? I'm not quite attracted to the view of it's God speaking that every single word is pristine and eternal and infallible. And this is fault filtered through me. I mean, I'm very aware there's a medium here, and I'm the medium for this particular set of messages. And God speaks in Jerry Martin American English. You can't think, well, that's how God talks to everybody. That's not very plausible. And God is answering my questions. Nevertheless, I feel this is a message from God and a very important set of messages from God. But I then worry, is, is it the real thing? Monsignor Guardini, in this very nice book on Art of Christian Praying, addresses that question and says it can happen to you. Sounds as if he's talking about a situation where it's like a monastery or somewhere. Everyone's doing a lot of praying. There's always a kind of a wall there. You're, you're praying and sending messages to God. All of a sudden, that God seems to be present to you. But my question is this, how do I know it's the real thing? And Guardini gives a very nuanced you can't believe every voice you hear, and yet you can't doubt every voice. Every occasion of divine presence or divine messaging, whatever kind, can be a nudge inside or a voice of conscience inside saying, you've got to do this. If you ignore them all, you're missing out on too much. You know, it's the problem of skepticism of the Cartesian program, a universal doubt. If you doubt, 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 doubt. You're never going to get anywhere unless you have a mythical certitude that he then comes up with, the kind of skepticism that we're heavily infected with in our culture really is not workable as a path to truth because you're skeptical and thereby avoiding certain errors, but you're also not taking in all the truths that are there. The advice of Gordini was talk to your elders, talk to them, but in the end, go back and listen and just calm down, quietly listen and pray about it. Sure, I mean, the question about a prophet's reliability is not a, a new one and it predates Descartes by millennia. I mean, we see it in uh, the Tanakh with debates so between Elijah and the priests of Baal and the way there that truth is determined is through this miraculous intervention on Mount Carmel. In the first century Christian text, the Didache, you can see that this early community for which these instructions are written is really concerned about how to distinguish between true prophets and false prophets. And the writer of that text indicates that it's ethical behavior that really will be the criterion to determine a true prophet from a false prophet.
But it's really only in the modern era that we see people like Descartes and Hume elevate the principle of skepticism to this default position. The skeptic, to echo your point here, certainly uh, it's hard to put over uh, one on him or her, but if you wall yourself off into a solipsism, it's hard to be a zealem for others. You ultimately have to determine what your fundamental orientation to the environment and the community around you will be. Are you going to be the one who, who wants to protect? Are you going to be the one who tries to avoid suffering at all costs? Or are you, are you going to be the one who's going to be vulnerable, which will certainly lead to suffering? Are you going to be the one who's vulnerable to being mistaken or learning that you've placed your trust in a religious figure who has let you down? That's a real risk. And that just comes with the territory of what religion is. That's the territory of an awful lot of life. As you were describing that, I thought these very words would apply very well to falling in love. One always has to be wary about being swept away by one's emotions in these romantic contexts. On the other hand, if you're too full of doubt, and I knew that there's risk to love of just the kind you were describing for faith in a particular religion or for more or less anything else we do, there's a risk. It's one of the challenges of the do or You try to help people, sometimes you just mess things up, but it doesn't work to then, well, I'm never gonna help anybody because I can't infallibly know if my help will be just what the doctor ordered. You're never gonna be able to love anybody if you just carry around this kind of corrosive, acidic, self-doubt and skepticism. That's, I think, what was at the heart of Michael Buckley's criticism of early modern deism. The shift to the subject and making subjectivity and individual consciousness the touchstone of how to live life has had the negative impact of creating a culture of individual monads, and that makes it harder to love. I don't want to sort of personally disparage any of the the giants of early modern thought, but uh, the modern West, and even I would say the postmodern West, this resolute skepticism that can harden into cynicism, it's not merely corrosion of religion. And I think the classical liberal critics of religion in the West need to understand this. It's corrosive of community as well. It's not as if the skeptic is going to be able to simply say, okay, I reject religious forms of trust. Now I'm going to be able to put my form of trust in secular alternatives, political, technological, economic, etc. It really is a one-way road once you start committing yourself to that, that idea that you need to be certain above all else. I think that when you see the sort of the backlash against individualism in the 20th century, you find forms of collectivity that in some ways are, are the, uh, the polar opposite of individualism. We need to find ways of thinking about trust that are less certain that we have a sort of dichotomous choice before us of gullibility versus solipsism. There's a lot of middle ground there. Yeah, and solipsism is not invulnerable either. It's a kind of pretend invulnerability, almost like the child, I'll hold my breath, or you even you can't see me. <laughs> but that trust is in a way where this began with, should I trust the voice? Can't be blind trust, but you don't get anywhere without some degree of trust and confidence. And if you talk on the personal level and the level of the community, one of the most important things in a community, one of its chief assets is social trust. And some of the countries in greatest trouble are countries in which they either don't have a tradition of social trust, they're wedded to smaller units, and it's very hard for such communities to thrive and prosper. We get way farther trusting each other, even though occasionally we let each other down, but we get way farther that way than with constantly having our guard up and thinking, no, I've got to undercut them to protect my own self-interest or my little group's interest. An autoimmune disorder is what happens when the body's defenses turn against itself. And autoimmune disorders can't be treated through the same sorts of medicinal means that we use for bacterial infections. And so those disorders can be, uh, in fact, the most risky and, and fatal of all bodily ailments. Cynicism is an autoimmune disorder of the psyche.
Because what it does is when confronted with the sad reality of broken trust, the response is, well, all people are like that. All societies are flawed. All rulers are in it for themselves. It's all about power. It's all about the lust for riches or fame. We're back once again to that sort of what Augustine called the curvatus asse, the curvature on oneself that he saw as the mark of the root cause of sin. And it's at that point that the mind just refuses to intake or be open to the possibility that maybe there is truth out there, that everyone doesn't simply try to cheat or lie or steal. The early modern thinker, who I've always been most influenced by since college is Pascal. Because Pascal was uh, capable of being a big skeptic, but he also, in the Pensees, said if you look at the world, there's not enough rational evidence to believe, but neither is there enough rational evidence to dismiss. And uh, I, I thought that's just a really brilliant way to approach the world, and then that's enter the famous wager where Pascal eschews the criterion of rationality as the method by which one will determine God's existence in favor of self-interest, which is another way of saying, how do you want to live? How do you hope to live, both in this life and in the next life? I think that's a refreshingly honest rejoinder to the doubters of past and present. One of the problems is the doubters focus on this as a, if it, the whole question was a proposition, that there is a God, God exists, something like God exists and told us to do X, Y, Z that some religion reports. But we're choosing, as you nicely put it, Chris, how to live. We're choosing a way of life. We're choosing a way of life for ourselves and for those close to us, our families, and for our community and our role in our community. We're choosing a whole way of life. That's an impoverished life. If you're living only for fame, and of course the people living for fame often discover that when they finally get the fame they've been seeking, it's kind of empty. They find themselves empty. They've done nothing for their own souls, their own healthy psyches. What's the point of endless money? You know, when I grew up with Scrooge McDuck was absurdly rich, had a whole big warehouse full of money, and he would just jump in the money (laughs) and swim around. Does that make any sense at all? Money is a means. And same with power. People have a quest for power. Power is essentially a means. What should the ends be is the crucial question. Just to acquire power, just to have power? These things don't make sense, and yet they have some natural impetus in, in human life. I'm reminded of something my high school theology teacher said when asked why he was interested in theology. He said, I like ultimate things. At the time, I had become quite a religious skeptic, but I was still interested in ultimate things. I always want to sort of return to that question, why? Why should I pursue this or do that? It's that that ground me in in the search for what Aristotle would call happiness. To get back to Tillich, what's your ultimate concern? I doubt for most people it's money. We live in terms of our own life circumstances, experience what the inputs are in terms of what we've read and what we've lived through. God speaking to me, who is uh, extraordinarily personal, even though God has these other dimensions beyond the personal. For a lot of people, God is either intellectually off limits for them, or they have bad associations with the concept of God, bad experiences in childhood. I know I have some that aren't exactly bad experiences, but they're extremely superficial, sentimental understandings that are an obstacle to uh, engaging in that tradition. I always advise, try to pay attention to the highest level thoughts you, you have, the highest level desires, the highest level conceptions, the highest level norms, And I'm trusting that, and I do believe, human beings have some capacity for distinguishing between the higher and the lower. But so don't worry if there's there's a God or if this is something God commanded or God wants or God is watching you. If those concepts are non-operable for you, just live in terms of the highest aspirations you can identify and try to live up to those. I think that's the point at which theists have to be aware that the language of God itself can be problematic, but there are alternatives. I think of someone like Rudolf Otto, 
in the early 20th century, speaking of the uh, Mysterium Tremendum et Fascinans, the fascinating uh, and tremendous mystery, or Karl Rahner's uh, phrase, holy mystery, in the ground of existence to describe God. A lot of people can reject the image of an old guy in a throne, but I don't know anyone, at least any adult, who, when willing to engage seriously in honest conversation, does not recognize that somewhere in life they have encountered mysteries that fascinate them. I don't know what those mysteries are, because for each person that's unique. That's where I think the conversation about God is often most profitably had. Other people have deep mystery too. <laughs> mystery isn't just the transcendent or this, you know, the divine and or anything in that ilk, but there are amazing depths and contours and lights and darks and ramifications and a kind of mysterious depth to what it is to be a person. Try to almost live up to that depth yourself. I was at one Christian sponsored conference at University of Toronto. Some guy started saying, what do people mean when these people talk about mystery? And he had a very logical mind. Uh, he was a Calvinist. And this bit, you know, he had just the right mind to do these Calvinist deductions. What do people mean by mystery? He just didn't understand it. He said to me, my wife is a mystery. And yeah, my wife has infinite depths as far as I can tell. So every, the women especially, but everyone kind of swooned. Then he went on. She does things that simply make no sense. <laughs> and we saw a kind of narrow-minded male-type rationalism or pragmatism or something come in. The swoon immediately dissolved <laughs> into, well, he doesn't even get to what a mystery is. And I guess some people just don't. You might be able to put him in a position where he confronted a mystery and came to see, ah, now, now I get it. Maybe a great piece of art or music or some work of literature where the mystery comes more palpably to his attention. We all have to find which concepts make sense to us, which ones fit our own personal experience, because we have somewhat different conceptual schemes. We're always trying to improve them and work them out. It's a sort of endless life project. Uh, at that very conference I was mentioning, there was a young Christian theologian, and I asked him, for some reason it seemed appropriate to the kind of talk he'd given, uh, why do you believe? And he said, it makes sense of the story of my life. And I thought, well, that's a pretty good answer. <laughs> and there's you know, not a propositional thing. Oh, I found these arguments that prove that God exists, but I'm living a life. And what makes sense of it brings out the meaning of it. He felt this, this set of Christian commitments did that. For someone else, it might be a quite different set of understandings or commitments. But in a way, that's, that's what one is looking for, what makes sense of your life. I've always sort of relied upon dramatic metaphors. What script makes the most compelling life play or life story? The quest for meaning, and for some of us, the quest for beauty and truth, to give the philosophers their due, and goodness, are criteria that impact huge number of people's decisions about what they are convinced is ultimate. And what is isn't the mystery of life is that we have so many simultaneous, it's like a multiplex theater, so many simultaneous productions going on at once. People sort of move in and out of each other's plays, uh, and that's a sort of beautiful kaleidoscope. Yeah, and that's one of the, I think, leading messages of God and Autobiography. God gives me a tour of these different traditions, starting with prehistoric people and going around the world. It's the God who talks to me, saying what God was trying to achieve with those people, and, and sometimes what they got right and what they got wrong. But in every, every case, there was something that was coming through that was from God. Well, God has these many aspects. And so he gave different cultures, different sides of God's self. Sometimes it's an interaction um, that they were responding to some aspect of the divine self. The Chinese picked up on cosmic harmony. And God says, I kind of discovered, well, I, yeah, I am kind of cosmic harmony. And we all have that kind of experience. God is discovering. That's good that they picked up on that. <laughs> it is another side of God's self. That was a motivation for Theology Without Walls, which uh, toward the end of the book, I'm told to start. How do you figure out a story or tell a story 
a lot of life in a community is how the stories go together. You look at any good dramas where there's a whole community and you appreciate the variety of characters, their strengths and weaknesses. They're all adding to the story, even though they're living out their different aspects. You talk about dramatic metaphors. I mean, that's a kind of dramatic metaphor for what life is really like. A lot of your task in mind, Chris, is this melange of stories of people living out lives, looking for meaning, truth, beauty, goodness, trying to instantiate those, trying to embody them and act on them. What is your role? What is my role? You don't have the role of trying to be the total. I often think of an orchestra. Maybe your job is to play the flute. It'd be very bad if the tuba player tried to take over the whole thing, but the tuba has an important role, and so does the flute. We all play our own instruments in this kind of ongoing drama of our lives together and our lives in tandem with whatever is ultimate. That's a good lesson for us all. The dramatic metaphor is actually quite powerful.